okay so i'll just see if it's coming up on the youtube here um well it will be so welcome once again to friends of tracking i'm not sure if this is coming up yet but we'll see i, I hopefully it is um very nice to see all of you back again and to see so many people coming in and watching our videos as well um today we have got um, four of the friends of tracking. Well, we've we've got myself, David, David Sumter. So welcome once got again to, sit, to friends of tracking. Put off my volume there. Yeah. I've got uh, myself, Sumter. I have got um, Laurie Shaw here um, from Harvard. I've got Fran Peralta from Hammerby, oh. and Javier Fernandez from Barcelona. And what we thought we'd do, we had a very exciting and long sort of in-depth conversation between ourselves last week. And I felt that that maybe uh, got a little bit carried away with just internal discussions and so on. So what I thought we'd do this week is we'll look a little bit more outwards and we'll look at a bit of what you guys who have been following Friends of Tracking have been doing. Um, if you've done your homeworks and what you've done past that homework, because we want this whole thing to be pretty interactive. So what I've, I just before I do before we go into the into that, what I want to start with is just say a few things about what we've been up to this week. William Spearman put a really good video up, and it was a kind of history, basically, of pitch control. Um, and he did a really nice historical bit at the end there, where he took in a lot of the people. Yeah, basically some of the, us sitting here, and also his own room, his own work, developing pitch control. So you should definitely check out that. And then the idea is that Laurie has been working together with Will and Laurie has been, uh, is going to do the sort of background and he's put up two videos now of a three video series looking at how you implement what Will was talking about in Python. So he's, he's doing his tracking data thing. And then the other thing that's been really cool is, is basically the response online. So it's so fun to see all of these. I was, Javier was just saying, you know, it's, it's really fun to see when someone puts up a hashtag FOT homework exercise. And it might not be the most amazing thing in the whole world with the greatest insight into football, but it's really nice to see that people can actually take the sorts of things that we've been talking about and implement them. We've seen Voronoi diagram after Voronoi diagram, maps, passing maps. And so we're going to go a little bit more into detail of that. And I'm actually going to scroll through the Twitter feed. So if you haven't put your homework up on the Twitter feed, do it now because I'm going to scroll through the, the Twitter feed and have a look at some of the things that have been posted there. Um, but before I do that, because we're meant to be have some sort of academic rigor, I'm going to hand over to Laurie and he is going to go over the homework exercise, the correct answers before we have a look at some of the things that have been sent in. Okay, so over to you, Laurie. Great, okay, so I'm gonna um, share my screen first of all. So you should be able to see a, a spider window. Is that, is, that, is, that, is that what everyone else can see? We can see it, but it's very small text. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll make the text bigger. Okay. Is that, can you read it now? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, just about. We can read on the Zoom, maybe just little, one step bigger, if you can. Yeah, it's absolutely huge on my monitor. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay well, I, I can see it anyway. Good, all right. <laughs> um, so, right. So what we're going to do is go through some other solutions, or at least the solutions that I came up with, um, to the homework that I set in the video last week. Oops. So, so this, in, in last week's um, hands-on video, I provided an introduction to the metrica tracking and event data. And so we covered you know, how to read it in, uh, how to identify uh, passes and shots in the event data and how to sync that up with the tracking data so that we could plot the positions of all players for any given instant of the game. And so the, the homework questions that I set um, were so the first question was to plot the passes and the shot leading up to the second and third goals of the match. So what we're going to do then is just step through my solution to this. Um, I've had I've seen at least four or five people post their solutions online, which is great. Um, 
people had different approaches to it. There's no wrong one right way, and everyone, you know, ended up with exactly the right uh, um, uh, plots in the end. The only one change that I'll I'll, I'll highlight now is that. In last week's video, when I presented the Metrica coordinate system, I said the origin was at the bottom left of the um, of the field. It's actually the top left. Metrica defined the origin as being the top left. So this is position zero, zero, and this is position zero, one. And so I made a slight change to the uh, Metrica IO uh, function that changes coordinate systems into meters. Um, essentially, you just have to add in a, a minus one. So some of your solutions might be flipped so that the the top is at the bottom and the bottom is at the top, but you know, it doesn't hugely change the actual, uh, any, of the, uh, any of the conclusions. So let's look at the answering the first question. So as I said, plot the, the uh, passes and shots leading up to the uh, second and third goals in the match. So the first thing we're gonna do is just uh, import the, uh, the, relative, the relevant modules. Oops, uh, ooh, why is that? Huh. Logical. Oh, I see what that is. Okay, I just got to change directory quickly. Okay. Right, and so now let's, um, I'm just gonna change the precision which we, with which we print numbers in pandas. Um, so let's first read in, read in the data. So we're gonna read in the tracking data, that's this line here, and then, sorry, reading the event data, that's like this line here, and then switch the coordinate system from this Sort of zero to one uh, to, to meters. So put in all that. Um, so the first thing we want to do is find all the all the shots in the in the event data. So we run that. And so this data frame now contains um, only the shots from the event data. And as before, you can see the um, the player that took the shot, the uh, position on the field in, in meters, and so on. And then we can find the goals as before by looking for uh, subtypes that contain the word goal. So we run that. And if we print that, um, we can see that there were five, um, five goals in the game. So the, the home team won three, two. So the, um, if we look again in the variable explorer, so I asked you to uh, make plots for the second and third goal. So the second goal is an away team goal um the Laurie, uh, Laurie, if you can increase the resolution at all that would be really appreciated on uh, uh, YouTube. Yeah. i don't know if i can do that for can i do that for this format uh resize uh, maybe maybe you can't on that one yeah yeah okay i mean the main thing here is that it's event um 1118 and so all we, all we need to do is just look at the move running up to that goal. So you may not be able to see this particularly well, but what I'm doing is opening the, uh, the data frame for all the events, scrolling down to index uh, 1118, which is, which is the goal. And if we look above at the events above, we can see that, um, oh, actually, sorry, the second goal is 823. So we'll look at that one first. So here, um, yeah, here's the goal, uh, index 823. And you can see the passing move starts from event 818. So there are one, two, three, four, five, uh, five passes, and then resulting in the shot. So in this line of code, what we're gonna do is plot the events um, from frame 818 to uh, 823. So if we run that, and I've made them blue because it's the away team. And this is the uh, the plot it comes up with. So we have a sequence. Of, obviously, the, the pass looks like it started here. And the move, you can see a sequence of passes around the field, ending in play, play 24, scoring goal in at the uh, at the far at the uh, at the far post. And as I said before, the version, if you posted some of these, some of these online will be flipped up and down because of the uh, the change in the uh, in the fix to the metrics coordinate system. Likewise, the the, set, the third goal um, is a home team goal. Um, you can see the passing move largely starts about eight or nine events forward. So if we plot, or right, can I say it again? Is there any way you could change the resolution of your screen? 
total screen, for example, like the whole Mac resolution or something, because it's it is. Uh, uh, can you not see the code? Uh, um, no, not really. Or it needs to be bigger. Make okay. the code bigger. It was as big as. <laughs> do you uh, have like some? Do you have one of these massive Mac screen things? Yeah. Okay. Is that <laughs> okay? Right. That might explain it. It's strange because I see it's fine. I mean, actually, with the with the previous Zoom, uh, I'm I'm not having neither resolution problems or or even Zoom. So I'm I'm wondering if it has to do with the live stream. I mean, it's it's strange that I mean I can I can see people complaining a little bit of or or, or asking to increase that, but it's strange. And now now it's it, now it's good. It's good on my computer on the live screen. So now that was that was better. So go yeah. go from there. Good. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm not sure what else. I'm not I, I try and look at increasing the resolution of this. I'm not sure how I would do that. Can I do anything? Yeah. Yeah, no, it works in this. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, it's the code that matters. Yeah, the code, the codes, the code's good now. Good. All right. So this is the this is the the third goal. I'm going to plot it from nine events before, which is essentially when the home team regained possession of the ball up until which the point where they scored the goal. So if let's run that line of code. And, and what you get is um, a few passes and then the final shot, but you can see it's all, it's all a bit um, obscured here. And the reason is, is that there were a couple of challenges in the events. If I zoom in here, well, it's very hard to see, but there are a couple of challenges in the events here as well as passes and shots. So we can make this a little bit clearer by just looking purely at the, by filtering out everything in the event that isn't a, a, a shot and a pass. And that's essentially what this line of code does here. So it's saying that oh, only select the events that are either a, the type is either a shot or a pass. So I'm gonna create a new data frame that does that and then plot the goal from that data frame rather than the full events one. And you get something that looks like this. So it looks, it looks a lot tidier now because it only contains the passes. So you can see the passing moves looks like it started in the home team half. They played it through a passing sequence that ended up with the cross and a goal and again at the far post. Can you see all that in the live stream reasonably well? Is it very small? Okay, I got a thumbs up from David even though he's muted. Everyone's saying it's good on the live stream now. I think it depends what country you're in and what internet you've got actually. All right, good, okay. Um, so the next question was plot all the shots by player nine of the home team um, and to use a different symbol for the goal. Um, so the first thing we do here is to select all player nine's shots. So we're looking at the event data frame, we're selecting shots and we're selecting, because player nine is in the home team, um, so team has to equal home and the from field has to be player nine to select the, the shots from player nine. Um, so if you run that, um, I'm gonna, well, I mean, I can open it up here, but it sounds like this is all gonna be too small for people to actually view, but you'll see that there are four shots in the end. And so the thing is we wanna be able to separate the goal from the shots. So um, the way that I'm gonna do that is like separate that into two different data frames. One that's a, just contains the goal and one that are shots that don't result in a goal. Um, so here you can see I'm, I'm slicing it such that the subtype contains goal. And in this second line, so that um, it inverts the filter so that it now contains anything that, for which the subtype doesn't contain a goal. So if I select and execute those two lines of code um, and then we can produce visualizations using the plot events function in the uh, in the metric of viz module that I wrote. And so let's just execute these three lines and see what we get. And here we are. So I've set the symbols such that circles are, uh, are goals and sorry, the square is a goal and the circles are shots and um, the, the goal is also colored in green. So there are four shots of which one was a goal from just inside the 60 yard box. Great, so moving on. Um, plot the positions of all the players that players nine's goal. So this is of course where we're moving into using the tracking data. So the first things we have to do is read in the tracking data for the home away team and convert the coordinate system again. 
Um, so let's run these two lines of code that do just that. And, and finally, the last step is we've already identified the goal from the previous answer. So we have an event for that. We're going to plot the, the frame. So that's the positions of all the players um, on, at the frame in which the, uh, the shot was taken. And then we'll superimpose the actual event uh, on top of that, which will just be the, the arrow indicating where the ball went. So this is really just repeating what we did in, um, in the course uh, in the online tutorial last week. And so here you can see the positions of all the players and the, uh, and the shot from player nine. So finally, question four was a little bit more challenging. Um, and I wrote, I uh, created this one because it related to this week's tutorial that was posted today, where we began to look at measuring and analyzing player velocities. Um, so as I said in the tutorial, like one of the very nice things about the tracking data is that it gives you measures of positions every 40 milliseconds, which means that you can use the time series to calculate the velocities and accelerations of players and sort of break down their match into periods where they were just walking around and periods where maybe they were sprinting and try to understand what they were doing in each situation. Um, so the first thing, so there are different ways of doing this. A, a lot of people essentially differenced the, uh, the position at two different time steps uh, and used that to calculate the distance. That's a completely fine way of doing it. The only slight issue with it is that there are sometimes outlying values, particularly when a player's position is corrected possibly because they, they were obscured or went off camera. So sometimes you get a few, um, you get a few, they can create a few errors in the distance covered, not by huge amounts, but perhaps by over the course of the match by hundred meters or so. Um, so the way that I'm gonna do this is measure the player's velocity at every instant and then multiply the, um, or their speed by um, the, the time step to, in order to get the distance. So dist uh, speed times time is distance. Uh, we can sum that up over the data frame to calculate how far they, they travel during the course of the match. So these two lines of code calculate the velocities for the players in the home and the away team. Let me, uh, let me run those. And then the last bit of this essentially loops through, first of all, it loops through every, both teams. So you can see I've created a list, which is that the home team, then the away team. So it's going to loop through the home team, then the away team. And then it's going to loop through the players in each team and multiply their speed. So the column here is the speed column that, um, that the code we just ran creates. Uh, multiply it by 40 milliseconds, which is 1 over 25, and then convert the distances to, uh, to kilometers. And then it's going to, um, to print out the distance traveled by, by each player in each team. And finally, make a little bar chart that also shows the, uh, the distances traveled by each player. So if I run this line of code, So you can see two bar charts being created. This is one for the home team, one for the away team. And it tells you that um, player five in the home team ran nearly uh, nearly 12 kilometers, uh, player six, um, about 10 and a half. And if you can see it on the uh, the window here, it's also printed out the uh, the distances ran by each player. Um, the All the solutions that I've seen that people posted online were correct. Like they were all within sort of 0.1 or 100 meters or so of the uh, the answers I gave here. So, well done everyone. And that's uh, that's it for uh, the homework that we uh, set last week. That's fantastic, Laurie. Uh, thanks a lot for for that. Um, if I can, you cancel your screen share. Yeah. There was a um, couple of questions I saw. Well, the, the biggest question that came up on the on the live feed was actually why your icons aren't straight. Or or uh, on your computer. They want your icons, the icons on the side of the files you're using. Apparently, most of the, the people who, <laughs> who were in the chat, they want them to be in straight lines and much better organized. So, so that was okay. what the main thing you got on the live feed. But um, more seriously, the, um, um, more seriously, the, um, one of the, uh, the questions was, I was actually going to ask about the ability of distance so can you really tell reliably how far 
different players have run during the matches. That's one of the things I think that it's, it's not always entirely accurate. How, how accurate is it, the distance run during the match? I mean, it's difficult to tell because you, you've you got to baseline it against some kind of ground truth. Mm. Uh, so it's you have one measure of the player's positions, which comes through the uh, optical tracking data. So the way that this data is actually collected is they have a, a wide field camera uh, that that records all the images at a frame rate of 25 per second. Then they use computer vision and machine learning to identify the players and and to, to triangulate them based on the, the sort of recognizing where the lines are in the field to figure out to understand where they are. Um, so that's 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 how that works. Um, of course, you know, like with as with all observations, there's going to be some measurement error there. There's going to be systematic errors and um, you know, essentially uh, statistical errors. So there's going to be some noise, some which causes the players to jitter around a little bit. And then there's also, you know, and this is true with all tracking data providers. Sometimes players are occluded and you can't quite figure out, you know, which is one player, which is the other. Sometimes they run off camera and they, you really don't know where they are. So it's um, so that there are sometimes sort of larger corrections, and you can see this every now and again in the data that a player sort of switches position very suddenly over quite a large distance. They almost mm. teleport across the field. Um, and so, and that's, that's essentially a position correction. And so you just want to be able to go through um, the data and try to at least try to find ways of alleviating those issues. Um, and the way, that, the way that I calculate the velocities has a little bit of an outlier removal stage where it says that if a player appears to have run more than 12 meters per second for a period mm -hmm. of time, um, then that's probably an outlier because that is the, the top speed that Usain Bolt hits. So, you know, we don't expect footballers to exceed that. And therefore, it's, it's probably more of a, an outlier than it is a, a realistic measure of their speed. Similarly, you know, we try to smooth some of the data as well, just to kind of average down some of the uh, positional noise as well. Mm. But, I mean, to answer your question, I mean, the, I think that it's, it's you, know, you know, if you really wanted to have a precise measure of the distance run down to the nearest meter, then you would have to have a system that, that could measure it that reliably and whether that would require GPS or um, you know some other system I, I don't know, but um, I mean the question is what 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 um, what error bars can you put on these distance measures? Yeah. Because I thought that was quite when I was looking at a new smoothing video and you were saying oh you've got to smooth these points and so on. It's it's never quite clear if by smoothing the points you're losing some information just because your points are moving around more smoothly doesn't necessarily you're capturing better the movement of the players. You know, and it can, it certainly can be the case that a player could very sharply stop, turn around and accelerate in the opposite direction, which, you know, you may end up smoothing some of that information away. And, you know, one of the things I'm very interested in with in, in the tracking data is how well, I think you can get a realistic handle on player speed, but I'm very curious to know how well you can measure player acceleration. Hmm. Um, you know, it's the second derivative of their uh, change of position. So it's, oh, oh it's the, uh, well, I guess the first derivative of the change of position, but it's, um, um, you know, it's an interesting quantity because it, 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 it correlates to player load and the forces that a player exerts on, on themselves as they mm. move around. Yeah, in that, in that line, just, just to add something, um, it's, in, I mean, a couple of things. One is that uh, I've seen many times when, when, we, when we speak with, you know, with companies that have tracking data or that get some kind of data from video, uh, a typical uh, selling argument is uh, you can know that, it, that, that the tracking data uh, is good because, you know, points move so smoothly. And <laughs> actually, it's not, I mean, it's, it's not a validation for, uh, you know, the quality mm -hmm. of data because you're basically smoothing to be eye-pleasing for people, but, but, but the actual tracking you have there is, is, is not smooth. So I, I have come to see that very clearly when you see, for example, uh, 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 tracking from GPS data. So mm -hmm. the typical thing is that for tracking data, you will have a frequency of 25 Hertz, but for GPS data, I mean, not actual GPS, but for uh, LPS systems and so on, you might have uh, up to 4,000 Hertz, right? So you have lots of frequency of data and you can see how even those very, very accurate systems, they, ha they have to do lots of work to try to, you know, uh, to clean a, a little bit that noise to actually smooth. So you're always going to lose information. And I think that following what Laurie said is, uh, it's very important to know uh, 
what can certain types of data work for. And it depends mm -hmm. on the type of data, on the way the data is collected and on how accurate you want to be. So basically simple thing, if you just want to know what travel distance or what is the typical travel distance of players and you want to know whether a player uh, did some more or less sprints or high speed running uh, events, you might have that with tracking data. But if you want to provide, for for example, information for a physical coach re regarding accelerations, or you really want to measure ac uh, accelerations through tracking data, it, it is now known that probably you're not, I mean, probably for sure, you're not gonna be as accurate uh, as it needed to be because it's, it's, it's like a very sensible thing. So it's, it's interesting that different types of data provide that, even though that you are able technically to get that I mean, from code, from tracking data, it's not going to be the best thing to do in particular with physical data. Yeah, I know there's, I mean, one interesting thing about analytics is when you hear these stories and I've heard them a few times about coaches that are only interested in one stat and it's how far their players have run. They just want to know, like, have they run around a lot? And if they run around a lot, then it's fine. If they've not run around a lot, then they've got problems. And um, obviously that, that's not the most, what, what would be the most informative stat that you can take of just, just from um, the speed and the acceleration of the players, do you think, of if you wanted to prevent provide it for a coach? For me is that uh, uh, there's, I mean, that's a very, very, very long debate, especially in sports science of, you know, the debate of, is it better to run more or or to run less, right? So, mm. did you perform better if you won running less or running more? It's, it's a it's an old debate and it has lots of things. But something you can do with tracking data is at least capture the context of the game. Not 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 it's not perfect for capturing context, but you can really get into a fine grained analysis of context. So, mm. something interesting you can provide having tracking data regarding uh, you know physical data is how much you run when you were in possession of the ball or how much did you move your opponent when you were in possession of the ball or are there more intense runs that you, that your player uh, players are you know doing are happening in counter attacks in fast attacks are happening at the end of the match in the beginning of the match are you running unnecessarily i mean you can answer those kind of things so if mm. there's something like a very simple thing is let's split, uh, you know, travel distance uh, during the possession and travel distance during defense, right? So mm. uh, just starting with that, you're gonna start grasping uh, or getting better information. Yeah, because that's why I would sorry, say one sorry. of the interesting things is is comparing, seeing if you have the same data for training, comparing, try to get an idea of the degree to which you're reproducing the conditions in training that players experience mm. in a match, you know, is the tempo of a training match, how does that compare, you know, particularly if you're trying to reproduce those match conditions, um, does a, you know, do the statistics of a player's physical performance, how, how do they compare in training to a match? And, you know, obviously the, the greater they are, then the, you know, the less well prepared you might be for the physical conditions of a match. No, that's that's uh, that's really true. The um, what I was thinking about here is is if you're interested in doing some more advanced homework, then it's just to take what Xavier said there is like seven or eight different examples of interesting thing about speed and acceleration and measurements and try and implement them on the data because I think you get a lot of interesting things just just out of those two matches actually. Yeah, and and just just to just to add something uh, probably more the direct that people can do, I mean, you can take uh, tracking data, try to get a good grasp of velocity, I mean, to really to calculate that and to know what's the speed of players in every moment. Um, you can basically split the ranges of speeds, uh, you know, following the standards. So you can know how much meters are players traveling, you know, walking or jogging or doing like medium intensity running and high speed running and sprints. So uh, it's interesting because you at least are gonna get, I mean, there's, there's an interesting stat that, it, that, that is used in sports science that is not only seeing uh, high speed running and high speed running is uh, meters or you know, distance travel above certain speed. I don't know actually the, the actual number, I think it's 
I, I won't even say it now, but it's, it's pretty well documented. Uh, so you may have those two values, but something that seems to be very interesting and, and provide more value is um, high speed running divided by uh, travel distance. Because what that is, is going to provide is how many, how, how much of the, of the, of the meters or, or the distance traveled by the player was in high speed running. So it provides you an idea of the intensity of mm. the actions, because depending on the player, on the team, on the position and many things, you're going to have different behaviors in terms of physical performance. So that can be something easy to, uh, to calculate. Not, not, not to do in, in, in one minute, but in one hour, you're probably gonna have it uh, well done. And it's interesting, you're gonna have uh, differences between players. So, so that was exactly the, uh, one of the topics in today's video tutorial that we posted. Oh. So uh, <laughs> actually- yeah. What's the video, uh, Xavier? <laughs> yeah, I can share screen again, and we can just see what that actually looked like for one of the um, sample matches. If you want, David? Yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. So this is just kind of covering some of the material uh, can you see my pipe, my spider window again? Yeah. Yes. So if I run this, so like um, part of, uh, let me make the, the screen bigger before we play it again. Uh, yeah. So like one of the things we did in today's online tutorial is break down player speed into walking, jogging, running, and sprinting, where walking is defined as less than two meters per second, jogging between two and four meters per second, running between that's kind of higher speed running between four and seven, and then sprinting above seven. And so if I run this whole script, uh, what it produced was, uh, okay, not sure why that's up here, but let me just put this back into the, oops, okay, let me just make that big. That's not the plot I wanted. It is, where has it gone? The music's gone off different screens. Hmm. It's moving a lot, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Diary. Thanks for your emails coming up. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm going to try to be careful of that, especially now people. <laughs> Where is it gone? Okay, let me run that again and see what happened to it. Oh, I know what the problem is. It's because I'm in full screen here. So, yeah, here it is. Mm. Yeah, so this is just kind of trying to break it down between walking is the dark blue, uh, jogging is the lighter blue, running sort of higher speed running is the uh, lighter red, and then sprinting is the um, is the is the darker shade of red, and then each cluster is a separate player. So, for mm. example, like the midfielders um, and the forward players of players five, six, seven, um, nine, ten. And so you sort of typically see kind of higher, more higher intense running for those players than the uh, the defenders that have a, a closer relationship between jogging and walking and jogging. Oh, that's interesting. I think that's one of the things every time I see that graph, I'm still amazed, even though I know about it, just the, the, the uh, sheer amount of walking done compared to, to running. There's uh, well, certainly sprinting. There's hardly any sprinting done. These football players are lazy. Yeah, I think, and also surprised that the goalkeeper often travel, you know, off, covers about five kilometers a game typically. Although the vast yeah. majority, this is the goalkeeper here, the vast majority of it is uh, is obviously walking. And there was one question. I'd, I'm just thinking I'd take this that came in on the feed that I was, and it was related to something that came up for Fran. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, how do we deal with the fact that the pitches are different sizes? Uh, well, that's something that we need to know from the provider, actually. That's one topic that we're discussing now with the data provider. And uh, depends if they give you the data normalized between zero and one, then you have to know what's the size of the pitch if you want to have the real meters, mm. like for distance covered and all this. And if they just give you the data in meters, they need to tell you how was the size of the pitch. Because if not, then you can't really plot things properly. Mm. So it's something that certainly you need to know from the provider, I would say. Oh, I mean, if it's your stadium, you know the size of it, but if it's like some other random smaller place, then you might not know it. Mm. And is it even, some teams even change the size of their pitch when there's a famous one recently that Malmö had Real yeah. Madrid coming. And yeah, exactly. They, they can make the pitches. Pitch. I don't know if, uh, yeah. if teams do that to Barcelona as well. 
that um, shorten the. Uh, no, that's not going to work with Barcelona. It's Real Madrid. You want to do that too, but you short <laughs> you you shorten the size of the pitch, and it gives you an advantage there. So it's not even if you know the size of the standard size of the pitch, it can actually change match for match. Yeah, going. I mean, uh, in in that question or in that comment from Fran, I think uh, yeah. I mean, both things are uh, fundamental to have. Uh, court, uh, coordinate in a zero one uh, you know range or zero one system and you need to 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 be able to transform to meters or to any other you know real I mean I mean uh, it can be pro provided in many ways but basically if you don't have both you probably can say uh, can say you have complete uh, tr tracking data in that sense in in the past what people d uh, do was really knowing the teams that were playing there and, and go to, you know, Wikipedia and get the, you know, the, the dimensions of the pitch because that wasn't provided I was mean, five years ago, but basically you will need both things. And a typical error, which is a simple thing that you might do when you're starting this is to use zero one normalized coordinates in X and Y and start calculating speeds or distance from that mm -hmm. and then trying to yeah. re Normalized and obviously the width and the height of a football field is not the same. I mean, this is pretty obvious, but th those are things that can really, uh, I mean, that happen when you're when you're working with that kind of data. Great. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over to um, going to go over to the uh, to Twitter actually and have a little look through some of the things that you've posted and basically summarize this and maybe give some feedback and so on. So uh, Laurie, Fran and Javi will be ready to give a bit of feedback, but I'll f start by sharing my screen. I'm going to carefully just share one window so I don't reveal my messy, messy. I think if they were shocked by your uh, <laughs> unorganized icons. They would be terrified by mine, who stretch over four computers as well. Um, so I'd have a little look at some of the um, FOT posts here. Have I got my Have I got my screen share on now? Yeah. Um, and what? Well, we've got Laurie there at the top. This This is one of the ones that came out top actually so it's, it's always interesting when you see these things put up on um on twitter because there's this this very strong feedback effect that if people like it then it gets lifted up to the top of the list and then people can like it more and more and more mm. this one i thought was really interesting because it was something i had never seen before um wasn't part of the homework but um path at Ale, um has taken the tracking data and he's done a thing where he's looked at big circles have passed into more space and smaller circles have passed into less space. If I click on this, I'll, I'll get it up. You can see there what, what, what this is, reveals a lot is that, of course, the passes back to the goalkeepers and defenders are into big spaces. And there's a lot of narrower passes when you get into the congested midfield. And I take it that these passes over here, they must be into passes to running through balls. So the, the players are running through onto the thing. So it's the space behind the defense. And there's an interesting difference here between the home team and the away team. So the, the home team were, the, well, the away team must have been defending much deeper, but there was a lot of passes in behind them. Um, have you any comments on this? Have you seen, have, I was yeah. thinking, most of all, yeah. Has I mean, anyone seen something like this before? I mean, I like it a lot. It's 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 pretty different from what I mean. It's 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 really hard to come up with a new plot on you know a two D field. So, uh, congrats for that because I think it was pretty in, ingenious. I will. I mean, um, I will. I will imagine that uh, you can even adventure to um, to say that home team and away team have uh, different ways of defending, and probably home team has a low block and a very intensive low, low, low block and not doing much of high pressure and just trying to get that block because you basically, because a weight team basically has lots of space when trying to, you know, to play in during build up, but very few space when uh, going into the opponent's uh, side of the field. Mm. Or maybe they, they, 
they don't have these skills to play there or they don't move a lot, but that's probably happening. And when you see a home team, you can see that probably away team, uh, it's doing high pressure, but it's also leaving spaces behind. So they're more broken up and you can basically have, op I mean, uh, more open spaces near their own uh, field or mm. near their goal. So mm. it's, it's interesting because just seeing that plot probably, uh, you, might, you might say that about those teams. Yeah. Yes, I don't know which. Yes. I mean, what teams are. So I'm just uh, adventuring to to say that. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree that it's um, it's very it's very interesting. I think my criticism of this, and I, I think this would be my criticism of most of these these types of things, uh, is that it's difficult to know anything without the context. I mean, you have a lot of these spaces, and as you say, there's lots of different interpretations you can do, give about that. But I think if you had a question in mind, a specific question about getting behind, or if you were interested in the through balls, particularly in the attacking final third, I think this could be a really useful plot to, um, to get the answer to that. I think also it could maybe be improved also by maybe not just taking a circle, but looking at the space on all sides or something like that. I'm not sure exactly because a circle might be misleading. I suppose it's the distance to the nearest player, but there might be a second nearest player and a third nearest player involved in that too. But I think it's a, it's a fantastic idea. It's really nice. Yeah, one of the interesting um, things, about the, uh, just breaking it down by pass length as well, you know, was, was a player moving into space uh, in, in space because the ball had been manipulated out to them or are these kind of long balls played over the top? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good. So... If I go down to uh, the next one here, um, here's yeah this this one I thought was interesting actually. This also got a lot of uh, a lot of likes and this was when I set my homework and I was quite clear in this homework actually. I said that the data should somehow tell a story that um, it should be something that you saw during the World Cup and I think everybody watched the World Cup so something that you thought saw during the World Cup and thought was interesting and deserves some more attention. And this was um, a, a thing by Alexander Andrzej, Andrzejewski. <laughs> Sorry, Alexander. Um, and what he looked at and what I was quite surprised at was the, just the sheer number of failed pass, passes by Rakitic against Argentina. Um, and there were lots of lots of passes or yeah, a fair number of passes, but a lot of failed passes in this, but nearly always very quick attacking passes, very long uh, direct attacking passes, which I think was probably a lot of lot of their secret of their their success. So I think it's it's nice when you see these both the text which describes the story and then a picture which then then explains um, what you're trying to communicate. I think that's that's really important if you're working in journalism with this type of thing. But even if you're trying to communicate with coaches, you know, this is the sort of thing you could put up before the next match against Croatia. And there was a few a few more of that type. If I put up the latest, I saw I saw one. I will come back to Vorgrams. Um, I thought this was nice that they'd actually been using the shot on. Um, shots on target as well. So actually where the, where the shots were taken from and connecting that up to, um, to the shots. And the one, the one I was looking for, what was the one I was looking for again? I should have, should have remembered this beforehand. Oh yes, the Voronoi's have completely taken over this now. <laughs> um, yeah, that was that one again. Just going um, to that the one you just showed with the, uh, the shots on target, it'd be kind of interesting to see if you if you could shade in the regions that were obscured by players along the line of sight from the person that took the shot, like what could, mm. how much could they actually have seen of the goal, um, given where the shot was taken and the, and the players in between? That you could only do with tracking data, I take it. I mean, that's uh, this was the event data. or but uh, Exactly, that's something that would be really nice to do with the tracking data in, in your example. One plot uh, that Fran and I make at, at Hammerby is that we try and link, so the instead of putting saved here, we say where the shot came from. So we look to see for particular strikers, we look to see, actually, can you explain this, Fran? What, what is it that we do? <laughs> we, we look to see um, where the, the area, where the ball was, the shot was taken and relate it to where it landed on the goal. So do they have a specific, if they're in a specific area, they want to go to another area? 
Yeah, it was like a pretty similar plot to this one, actually, because mm -hmm. like the down plot, it was the same, just the goal with the position. And what it did, I mean, the only thing I could figure out was dividing the real 2D map of the pitch in different zones. I think I did six and plotting them with different colors. Mm. So shots that come from the left side of the box are painted in blue. And then on the other plot, they're also painted in blue. But then the problem that that has is that you don't know where each individual shot come from. You just know that it come from a certain area, but not exactly which one of the shots are were done from that area is that shot. So that was the only thing I could come up with because that's, I think it's pretty difficult to visualize like linking those two plots together. Now, this is something that goalkeeper, our goalkeeper coach likes a lot is to see yeah. um, what types of shots they're likely to occur, what, where a striker is likely to shoot. And we have a goalkeeper mm -hmm. also, a sort of, he studied theory um, idea about it, but I think he wants to know where the players are likely to shoot in advance. And um, yeah. I think that can be very powerful for, for some goalkeepers anyway. Yeah, with this kind of shots, with plots, you can see like if if a, if a striker tends to shoot to the long post or more to the center or more to the his more uh, closest post and that's kind of useful information and sometimes you see that maybe one player shoots a lot from one side of the box but then his goals actually come from the other side where he shoot less or something like that which is quite interesting to see Good. Well, there's so many of these. Will, will we take will we take a Voronoi then? Um, I think this this got started a lot with um, it's the yeah. Let's oh, that's why is that yeah. So there was a very nice post by Dan Nip, and he had implemented this Voronoi at a um, Opta Pro forum um, recently, and so. Maybe would someone like to explain the explain the principle of the Voronoi before we go into the um, um, I'm spotlighting you, Laurie. <laughs> I don't know why I've spotlighted you because you haven't said at all that we should use Voronoi things apart from maybe you could do it, have what is your exercise. But what's what's the principle behind the Voronoi? So I think the idea is to kind of mark um, all the areas around a given player that they are the closest player to. Mm. So, um, I mean, you can see kind of in this example, the idea is a sort of a way of breaking down the field such that you can allocate bits of the field to a kind of reference position. And obviously, in this case, the reference position is the players themselves. Um, and so it, it's a sort of rude, I guess you can call it a rudimentary um, measure of pitch control. So what, how big is mm. the area of the field that is dominated by each player? Um, obviously, you can see that there's in the image that we can that we have here, players are in isolation, dominate a much larger area than players that are in the crowded areas of the field. Mm. And you know, and I think a lot of the stuff that will, or some of the pitch controls stuff that will presented um, in his video yesterday, um, are a kind of more advanced versions of this. You know, taking into account, mm. for example, where a player is running and how quickly they could get to a spot, rather than just a sort of geometrical measure of how close any given area of the field is to a, to a player. Mm. And uh, Javé, did you make Voronoi diagrams before you went over to the pitch control stuff? Is that the, one of the first things you did when you started working in football analytics? Or did I you think it was actually that? the first thing I did. Yeah, the uh, very first thing. <laughs> and, yeah, in that moment, I was basically saying like, okay, this is, this is cool. It changes when, you know, when dots move. The thing is that, um, uh, I think coaches don't like Voronoi uh, or people from the football world don't like when they see this, uh, I mean, particularly Voronoi and this kind of plots because uh, you can very quickly see that it does, it's not very, uh, what's the word? Uh, I don't know if it is natural or it, 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 mm. it, it doesn't capture things that for human beings are really obvious. Like for example, I mean, near uh, the midfield there, uh, my issue with Borno, and you can see it there, is that um, two uh, two players are, are separated by one meter, 
one player has, I mean, that space on 100% and the other player has that other space 100%. And, and we'll uh, explain that pretty well in his video, saying that uh, this is a very important issue. And the first thing he said was that probably that line is not like a straight line. We can bend that line a little bit more. But the important thing is that, and that's uh, the first issue I saw there, is that you need to account that there are different levels of influence in uh, in player space. So if you're nearby to someone else, uh, Vorno is not capturing that. And since mm. football is a sport when the most relevant things are not really frequent, are like there's a lot of outliers and those things that are special really determine what you're going to do in the match, it is important to try to fine grain things like, I mean, these kind of things when you're trying to analyze space. Mm. So that's my, my main issue with Vornoy. Vornoy has something interesting, and I, I think that's why people like to do it first. That is very easy to compute that efficiently, and it looks good, and it, it makes sense. But if, if I will do just Vornoy, I will start doing something like, there's like a, an, 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 a first or like an idea that was implemented a long time ago that they call like weighted Vornoy. Mm. Like, for example, in... Luke Burns and I think it's Andy Miller. I'm not sure now. Paper is called uh, NBA Court Realty. It's very, very, very interesting paper. It's very easy to read and I think it has a good practical point. Uh, it's in basketball, but they say, okay, we want to use Vornoy to make this fast, but we, we're going to use a weighted version. And the weighted version is you are still calculating the distance of every player to any location, but you're mm. weighting that or dividing that by distance for example. Mm. So it, you have different degrees of ownership. Uh, it's a way you can do that, but I will definitely try to do uh, or to implement some other kind of pitch control models because uh, it's going to be misleading in, in many things. Mm. Now, I think I'm going to, you, you wrote a very nice paper together with Luke, actually, this review paper. Maybe you could type that into the chat if you can, and like reference to that. This, this was a sort of nice review paper you went from Voronoi to this exactly this acceleration accounted for Voronoi and then control as the final thing. So uh, I found that a very valuable sort of history um, of the development of this thing, because I, I think that really is the thing that what um, what William was talking about was it, the pitch control is really where Voronoi went later on, that it um, got replaced by control measures. But there is one thing that